Good morning and welcome. And welcome also to those of you uh, watching this National Press Club Newsmaker via live webcast. I'm Diane Sines of the National Press Club Newsmakers Committee and Climate Nexus. Today, our briefing will focus on an expanded look at the California drought's disproportionate impacts on the state's agricultural sector and the need for better groundwater management. Climate change in the form of precipitation changes and reduced snowpack is threatening reliable water supplies in some regions. Climate change has intensified the California drought by fueling record-breaking warm temperatures that evaporated the critically important snowpack, converted snow to rain, and is now drying out soils. The winter of 2014 in California was the warmest in 119 years of record keeping, according to NOAA, smashing the prior record by an unprecedented margin. A key message from the third national climate assessment was that due in part to accelerating climate change, seasonal droughts are expected to intensify in most US regions, and longer term droughts are expected to intensify in large areas of the Southwest, which includes California. This trend is a huge challenge for improving our water systems to support crops and livestock yields in the region. The National Climate Assessment suggested that as, a, as the risk of drought increases, groundwater may be tapped more during periods of drought despite limits to this resource given current management and institutional frameworks, as these UC Davis experts will describe in more detail. We are very lucky that our speakers brave travel during incredible thunderstorms last night um, to travel to Washington and present their latest findings. Uh, following the scientists' remarks, uh, Secretary Karen Ross will discuss the scope of California agriculture, California farmers' ever-improving water efficiency, and the state's response to the drought. Uh, so I'd like to introduce our speakers. Um, Richard Howitt, to my left, is Professor Emeritus at UC Davis Center for Watershed Sciences. Jay Lund is Director of the USC Davis Center for Watershed Sciences. And you'll see the names of the additional team members who produced this new report on the cover page of the new report, uh, which can be found at https colon watershed.ucdavis.edu forward slash 2014 hyphen drought hyphen report. Um, and then to my right, I have Karen Ross, Secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture. Uh, she's uh, most recently, uh, former chief of staff to uh, Ag Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack and former president of the California Association of Wine Grape Growers. We will leave approximately 30 minutes for questions, and working journalists will be given priority in asking those questions. Those of you listening via the web may email your questions to me until 11.30 a.m., and I'll um, ask as many as time allows. Thank you. Richard, you're up. Thank you, Diane. Um, California economy, seventh largest in the world, country, runs on three flows, resource flows, energy, information, and water. This year, we got to get by with one third less water in our regular supplies than normal. There's, there's two takeaways from this, and I'm just gonna run through the study. As an, as, as an economist, I was interested in what's the economic effect of this water, and as a resource and agricultural economist, I'm looking at the impacts on the agricultural sector, although we are tied in also with the urban sector. So what we did is we took a model, which is just a computerized version of what we think farmers and prices and quantities will do, and we linked it at the bottom end to an engineering model of ground, underground water flows. And on the top end, we linked it to Landsat satellite projections. And we have the economic model operating in between them. And so we're going to look at this and project it out and say, what is likely to happen this year and next year? So first slide, please, and I'll just talk over them, and away we go. Can we click it up? Do I click it up? 
There we go. It bings at me anyhow. There we go. So th this is, these are the districts of our main economic model. And, and here's California. And for those of you who, who have um, de been deficient in your education and not been there, um, you can tell by my accent, of course, uh, that um, it's about 1,000 miles from top to bottom. You know? and we run water 660 miles from where it occurs in the top. And Jay will show you later to where the money is in the bottom. Um, and this goes to, the, of course, the fundamental law of economic hydrology that water flows up hills, over hills, towards money. Um, and so that's why the economics of water is particularly important. We, and we have these models linked. We did a survey. Um, this, is, this first model is water-driven. And then when we come back with the satellite data, we're looking at, at land from a, from a spectral remote sensing point of view. And we are interested in how much ability the farmers have to switch their supplies from these normal surface river and canal water to the underground water, which we call groundwater. And then we're going to run another year out using um, some projections from 2009 of what 2015, 2015 and 2016 might look at, like. So here's, here's what we're losing. We're losing. Um, 6.5 million acre feet, well, a million acre foot, an acre foot is 330,000 gallons, so you can run your calculations in terms of gallons, and it's billions. Likewise, um, we're losing most of it from that central part of the valley, which is the key agricultural area. In terms of the ability to replace it, we've measured that ability to replace it, and we think that we'll lose 6.5 million, that's one third, but 75% of that, we're estimating, will get replaced by the additional pumping of this underground water, which we normally have plentifully supplied, but remember, we're running down our bank account. And here's the impacts. Our net water shortage is only 1.6 million acre feet. We're losing about 810 million direct farm gate value we are spending another half a billion on extra pumping. And our livestock sector, uh, which is losing 200 million through increased prices of feeds. Overall, if we run this through the entire economic model selection, we lose about 2.2 billion worth of revenues. But what really hurts is we're also losing 17,000 jobs these are seasonal, mostly seasonal jobs, but they're seasonal and full-time. And they are from the, a sector of the population who have the least ability to roll with the punches. And this is really important because whilst on average, you in Washington and elsewhere will all get your fruits, nuts, raisins, vegetables, and wine, but there are pockets of extreme deprivation where they're out of water and out of jobs. And so we have... On average, it's not so bad, but in certain parts of the Central Valley, it's extremely bad. And if you're one of the 17,000 people who lose their job, it's extremely bad. So I'm trying to get a balance on this economic picture between rolling with the punches, but still having pockets of pain and poverty. So what happens to the... To, to the um, land reduction. And we've got three main areas. We've got north of Sacramento, north, uh, divided by rivers, north of Sacramento, the San Joaquin, which is the northern part of the, of the Central Valley, and then the Tulare Lake Basin, which is at the bottom. Uh, and then we have the coastal regions. It turns out the coastal regions, those of you who are wine aficionados, work, don't worry, your Napa wines will be just fine, as will the Monterey and, and the other ones. Uh, the vegetables are largely grown with underground water, and we think that they will, the price of lettuce will not be going up. The broccoli will be there as usual. What we do see, though, is we see in the Tulare Lake region that green histogram is actually a loss of permanent crops. And when we switch from a land area, acres, to money, we see that the real costs are coming in 
with the loss of some of these permanent crops. And so there are some citrus orchards, some almond orchards, which are just going to be dried up. And this is a loss not only of revenue for this year, but for a future stream of years, because this is a permanent capital asset. And so whilst if we look at the areas, you'll see the blues and, and the light blues are the biggest areas. If we focus, as an economist, I'm interested in money, then you suddenly see that this relatively small area of permanent crops dominates the money effect. And that's where, that's where the multi-millions come in. So again, this is a reiteration of what I had before. 17,000 jobs, 2.2 billion of revenue, and uh, half a million or 430,000 <laughs> acres additional land fallowed. Fallowing, of course, is when the farmers do not have the water to irrigate the land. And in California, no water, no crops. Here is uh, an example of um, detailed land use from outer space. And we worked from, with our colleagues in NASA and the Department of Water Resources. And we used the Landsat satellite, they used the Landsat satellite, to identify using a thing called normalized relative vegetative index, NDVI, a measurement of the degree of greenness at certain times. And these are shots built up from a flight we, the satellite took about three and a half weeks ago. Because what we're trying to show here is how to manage drought, we need timely information. And this is one source of timely information. The other interesting thing is that you can see the proportion of idle land, and we can't directly say all of this was caused by uh, water shortage because there's other reasons of late season planting and so on. This might be exaggerated. Uh, but this is the same, uh, is a good indicator. In terms of the cross check of the economic model, two out of the three regions cross check closely. This third southern region actually is got much higher values from satellite readings than the water-based readings. Those will reconcile as the season comes on. What I want to stress to you is that we have the ability to both interact with the engineering models to look at the number of wells that might go dry on one side of the economic model and back up to the satellite information on the other. So. What further work do we have to do? We have to have more interaction with these underground water models because it's quite clear that the underground groundwater is the reserve bank account. The problem is that California is almost uniquely in the Western states of not measuring our groundwater. So we're like somebody who is so rich they don't have to balance their checkbook. We're walking around signing checks and not even balancing the checkbook because we still think we are in a groundwater-rich era. And so every other Western state has started to measure its groundwater, and we don't even measure our groundwater. I live on a small property. I have two wells. I pump what I want to pump. I pay the electricity bill. That's it. So um, we are operating with a Daniel Boone type economy um, in terms of water. Do you remember Daniel, that, that, that he built a cabin and then wood was cheap, but nails were expensive. So when he moved on, burn the cabin, pick up the nails. Don't worry about the person coming behind you. Um, well, it made sense for Daniel. And it made sense for California when we had lots of, of water. It doesn't make sense any longer. The other thing is we have to work with this remote sensing. Because not only can we measure where the fields are fallow, but there are techniques which we're working with to measure the actual water use on the fields. And then finally, as the drought and afterwards it goes along, we have to do a retrospective analysis. We also think that the water transfers between water, relatively water-rich areas and relatively water-short areas need to be encouraged and facilitated. And so these are the areas of additional work needed. And now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Jay Lund, who is going to give you some really interesting stuff on what will happen next year. 
Thank you. Uh, one of the interesting things about droughts is you're not really sure when it's going to end. You know, you know with a flood that it's going to end in a few hours or a few days. You know with an earthquake it's going to end hopefully in a few seconds or a few minutes. But with a drought, you're never really sure when it's going to end. Is it going to be a two-year drought? Is it going to be a six-year drought? Is it going to be a 12-year drought? And in the history, paleo history of California, we have 200-year droughts, if you go back and look at tree rings and things like this. So is next year going to be dry? It's a good question. Are we going to go for broke this year and you know, empty all the reservoirs in the hope that next year is going to be dry? They talk about El Nino all the time. So will next year be dry? So we, let's look at the 106 years of record. We are in a critically dry year this year. Uh, Department of Water Resources classifies years into six five-year types, from critically dry, dry, all the way to wet. If you're in a critically dry year this year, then the chances that next year will be critically dry in the Sacramento Valley, which is most of the, where most of the water comes from, is 29%. The chances that it will be merely dry is 35%. So there is a very good chance that next year will be dry or critically dry, given that this year is dry. It, it basically doubles the chance that next year will be a drought if you're in a deep drought this year. So that's the first, the first point, I think, to make. It's a similar story for the San Joaquin. Now you say, OK, but they talk about El Nino all the time. What does that mean? So here's a plot of the 50-some years of record where we have the annual runoff. This is for the Sacramento Valley and the El Nino index. So further over to the right is a bigger El Nino. Further over to the left is a smaller El, El Ni La Nina, right? Um, I'm from California. I should know these things. Um, so you can all see the trend here. Th this is citizen science. Can you all <laughs> see the trend there? No. OK, so I tried to use some of the more advanced scientific techniques <laughs> to try to tease out the trend here. And I also will add some additional data for the San Joaquin. There it is. So I fit all kinds of lines. I get maybe 1% or 2% explanation. One that has the most explanation, which is actually not a good fit, is that smiley thing at the top. I get 8%, but it's a use. Anyway, don't count on El Nino. It's not probably not relevant. It's more relevant in the southern part of California, particularly for, for floods. It's less relevant for northern California for droughts. So that's that. A little lesson in, in water in California since we're in, in, the, uh, in the east. Uh, the map on the left shows the precipitation in California. Notice how that really dark blue area is the 20% of the surface area that provides two thirds of the runoff in California. That red area, so also notice where the, where the agricultural areas are. Down here in the Central Valley, down here and along the coasts. The agriculture and the people are where the water ain't. And our water use is in the summer. And we have a Mediterranean climate in California. Beautiful summers, dry. So the water is where the water, where the, where the water demand ain't, both in space and in time. And so in California, the map on the right shows the um, Infrastructure, the huge amounts of infrastructure that we've built. Surface water, groundwater, dams, reservoirs, all kinds of things. All sorts of water agencies to move this water around. On the lower left, you'll see a pipeline with a little person in it. That's one of our smaller pieces of infrastructure to move water around. And so we have a very integrated system. When we had a drought in the 1860s, when we were primarily an agricultural economy, aside from the little bit of mining we did, um, it basically destroyed the whole economy because it, at that time it was rain-fed cattle grazing and uh, basically destroyed the entire economy when we have a drought. It's remarkable to me that we have so little impact because we have this infrastructure and a lot of the management and water markets and groundwater that we mentioned before. So some lessons of the overall effort for policy. Um, droughts are inevitable in California. We have a dry state. We have earthquakes and we have droughts. The East Coast? You have thunderstorms. You have hurricanes. Nobody thinks, OK, we have to hurricane-proof the Outer Banks. I mean, nobody even thinks about that. It's not possible. Same kind of thing in California. You can be prepared for them. You can be prepared for these disasters, but they are inevitable. 
the approach we should take is a portfolio approach. There's a lot of different things. We have a lot of folks saying, we should do this, we should do that. We need to do a lot of little things, some big things, combined, integrated together in a thoughtful way. Groundwater is very high on that list. As Richard said, 75% of the water, surface water lost to, uh, due to the drought is being made up with groundwater pumping. Water markets are very important for reallocating that water in this very dynamic economy, dynamic climate that we have in California so that we stay on top of things. And information is really important. That third flow that keeps California's economy going, potential for remote sensing estimates, and the importance of us going back after the drought and after the press is over to, to go back and do this retrospective. So that's where I'd like to end it. Thank you very much. Followed by Secretary Ross. Great job. I have no PowerPoint, um, but I am pleased to take a few minutes to talk about um, why we requested this study and how it's being used um, and, and why California agriculture is a unique gift to the citizens of this country and increasingly to citizens around the world. When we look at California as the number one agricultural state and has been since USDA started measuring our output over 60 years ago, and it's also the number one exporter of agricultural goods and products. A lot of that is because of the great, unique Mediterranean climate that we've been blessed with, the great soils that we have, the wonderful institutions like the University of California, and the really smart and resilient farmers and ranchers who are constantly diversifying the agricultural portfolio to respond to markets. And that certainly is one of the changes that's happened a lot in agriculture since, since the drought when I moved there in 1988. And that is moving higher and higher up to higher value crops that are permanent in nature. And that's probably one of the most significant changes in our agricultural landscape that we're very mindful of when we look forward to how do we better prepare, plan, and respond to droughts which we know are inevitable. California agriculture has done a lot over the last 50 years to improve its productivity and to better use water more efficiently. In fact, we've had over an 80% gain in productivity using the water that we have much more wisely and much more precisely. Almost 50% of our irrigated acreage is actually under some sort of precision irrigation technology that could be drip irrigation, micro sprinkler irrigation, or drip tape, which has really been a significant contributor to us being the producer of over 95% of the processed tomatoes. So if you like salsa, pasta sauce, and ketchup, California is your source, and we're happy about that. We are also a significant dairy state. Over 20% of the milk that's produced in this country comes from California. 400 different commodities. So we have a lot depending on water, which, which is what it takes to grow livestock and food and feed crops in California. We commissioned this study because in 2009, it was the first time in a drought that we tried to evaluate what the socioeconomic impact is of drought. It was very important because we were caught somewhat by surprise by food lines in Western Kern and Fresno and Tulare County. Those people that are so dependent on those seasonal jobs were at the same time without employment and going to food banks. So doing this report early this time so that we could better target the resources that the legislature and the governor made available was one of the major reasons we wanted to do this. But we also knew that droughts will happen again because of our changing climate. We're very focused under Governor Brown's leadership to really looking at mitigation and adaptation and how do we put resiliency into our systems at the local regional scale as well as on a statewide scale to be able to survive droughts better. So we believe that this is a very valuable tool for us moving forward. Um, before we knew how serious this drought was last fall, Governor Brown asked the Resources Agency, the Environmental Protection Agency, and my agency, the Department of Food and Agriculture, to create the California Water Action Plan. What he wanted was a comprehensive but focused list of actions that we could take over the next five years to better prepare our state for our water future. A water future that will grow from 38 million people to 50 million people by the year 2049. A water future that still has a fast growing economy that is very dependent on water, whether you're doing computer chips or broccoli. And a water future that will be part of a changing climate. That water action plan actually addresses some of these water policy issues that you've highlighted, Jay. 
One is that there's no single action that we can take to better survive drought in the future. It does take a portfolio approach. It requires that Californians develop an ethic of conservation, that we improve our water use efficiency on our farms as well as on our urban landscapes, that we embrace recycling of water, that we're capturing stormwater, that we are investing in storage, whether it's above ground or below ground. And yes, it is time for more effective groundwater management. And that is a focus right now of extensive dialogue in our, in our state capital. We've had two bills introduced. Governor Brown re released his framework for what he thought effective groundwater management would look like in California. We have groundwater basins in some parts of the state that are very well managed, but we have others that need additional tools and authorities, and that's what the Brown administration is committed to doing. We believe that groundwater is best managed locally, that we have too many geographic and hydrological differences, diverse economies and diverse stakeholders to try to make a one size fits all. Local management with the authorities that they need is goal number one. We want a definition of sustainable groundwater management. We want to provide the tools and the technical expertise to assist the local authorities to better manage their groundwater. Those funds have already started to be, be made available through the budget this year with resources for the Department of Water Resources to be able to provide groundwater information to the extent that we have it as well as best management practices and guidance on how to develop local groundwater plans. We also, as a state, have signaled that we will intervene on a very narrow, focused way when local authorities are unable to develop an entity to manage that groundwater or to have effective groundwater plans that meet the goals and objectives that are stated. So we are prepared for a vi very vigorous discussion our last month of the legislature, which will start in August. Um, the governor signaled um, three weeks ago that he is supportive of a groundwater bond. I'm not a groundwater bond, a water bond. Groundwater would be a part of that. And so those negotiations will be something else that will be going on during the month of August. We think that this investment in restoration, the investment in storage, having effective groundwater management, recommitting to recycled water, stormwater capture, flood planning, and conservation will all help us be more resilient going forward. And with that, I think I've left just enough time for hopefully a lot of good Q&A. Thank you, Diane. I really appreciate this opportunity. And to the professors and the university, thank you for maintaining your sense of urgency. We have already put hundreds of thousands of food boxes out into the Central Valley. We've been able to target assistance for housing. And so you've really helped us put those resources that the legislature provided earlier this year to good use for our people. Thank you. Thanks so much, Karen, Jay, and Richard. Um, I'd now like to open the floor for questions. Um, does anyone have questions for our speakers? Mike. Yeah, I'd like to go with the Flash newspapers. Um, could you speak to what role, if any, additional storage capacity would have in meeting the uh, short and midterm water needs of the state? Uh, I need to repeat the questions for those people who are following via the webcast. Um, so, if I understand you correctly, um, uh, LP, what, what role will future, what role, if any, does uh, additional storage play in meeting the state's short and midterm water needs? What role does storage play in meeting the state's um, needs? Well, um, storage is very important for, for water management in California. You can see the, the tremendous amount of um, water that's coming out of storage this year uh, in the form of groundwater storage uh, during the drought. The total amount of water coming out of groundwater storage this year, is, this year is considerably more than the state water project has ever delivered in a year. So, and the state water project is a very large surface water project. So the, the groundwater is always the major source of water storage for drought. For shorter droughts, Surface water storage is important, and for the urban areas, it's a little bit more important. But groundwater is the major major source, and that's the that's what we're mentioning here. That that uh, in our report, that that needs more attention. 
if we had more surface storage, uh, which is what a lot of the conversation is about, would that help us a lot? In some places, it, it would certainly help as, a, as someone who specializes in reservoir operations. Uh, I can honestly say that a reservoir operator will never turn down free storage capacity. But we have a very real problem in California that our, we often have more of a shortage of water than we have of storage capacity in that storage capacity doesn't do you any good for droughts unless you have enough water to fill it. And in some parts of the state, we don't have an ability to get water to those locations in order to fill up the storage so that it will be useful for droughts or, or the dry season. And that's our, our biggest conundrum. It's not just storage. You have to have this portfolio approach where you combine that with the management of, of uh, conveyance and uh, water demands. Do either of you want to add anything? I, I just wanted to say that wherever we can add storage um, for purposes of groundwater recharge is something that we really need to do if we want to be better prepared for future droughts for agriculture in particular. I, I think we're likely to see more use for, of additional storage for sort of what I call boutique purposes, um, one of which would be to, to regulate surface waters so you can get it underground and store it for droughts. Okay, um, we have a question from uh, NBC News uh, remotely um, at, from John Roach of NBC News. Um, as groundwater pumping increases, is there impact to surface water infrastructure via land subsidence? What steps can be done to mitigate? Uh, yes, in some places we are seeing that. Um, particularly in areas that are newly developed, have new, newly developed groundwater, newly pumped groundwater. Um, but we don't have much surface water apparently to run in some of those aqueducts anyway. So maybe for this year it's not such a big impact, but it will be a, an impact for a long time to come. There's, there's quite a uh, potential for structural damage to some of the canal system. Anybody else want to address that? Okay. Other questions? Yes. Uh, it's uh, Alan Berger. Alan Berger from Bloomberg News. A question primarily directed towards Secretary Ross. I uh, would like to know a little bit about some of the structural changes you might see in California agriculture because of You talk a lot about water efficiency, um, but still, uh, almond trees take twice as much water as some vegetables. Over time, do you see fewer trees and more vegetables as a result of these strains? Well, California farmers and ranchers are very responsive to what market signals are out there, and I think that we will continue to see the move up the value chain chain to higher and higher value crops. And I don't want to pretend to be an economist because Richard is one of those. But I, I think that we will continue to see the, this trade-off that farmers and ranchers are making now. There are many farmers and ranchers who some of their agricultural acreage is in trees and vines, but not all of that. Um, so that, that's one part of the equation that's out there. And so people are giving up that annual crop to be able to save the permanent crop because they're trying to put their water and land into the highest and best use of those inputs for the values that they're bringing back to them and to that local community. I think that structurally we will continue to see people, you saw the cotton and feed grains and oil seed crops are the ones that when you're looking at a flexible decision this year, those are the kinds of crops you're gonna give up, fallow that acreage to free up the water that you do have. Richard, you probably wanna say something about what I just commented well, I, on. I, I agree with everything you said, Karen, and let's focus on the value per unit water of vapor transpired. And if you look at that, then you'll find that almonds and walnuts and pomegranates are extremely valuable. We have about one third of our acreage in permanent crops and then another 15%, 20% in vegetable crops. I see this expanding as the markets expand. There's no question that we have a unique climate advantage in growing these crops. The world's middle class is expanding, and they like to go to salad bars, or they like to feed their children healthy foods and safe foods, and that's what we produce. So I see us shifting, but the analogy is this. If you're looking for greater returns from your retirement account and your advisor pushes you into high-tech stocks, at the same time you need to also balance your portfolio, and this is going back to what Jay was saying, and you might simultaneously buy more bonds for, 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 to keep your risk level the same. So as our markets and our growth in these areas expand, we've got to change our crop mix and we've got to change our way of managing water to keep the risk 
within bounds. Yes, next question. Sir, if you could um, identify yourself. Yeah, I'm Bill Marsden with Post Media News, Canadian newspaper organization. Um, I'm trying to get a picture of the sort of size of the impact of the drought in California on the food industry. I mean, does it impact the entire agricultural industry throughout the state? Is it something that is only like affecting 50% of farmers? The question is, um, what's the scope of the drought? Um, is it affecting the entire agricultural industry or just certain pockets? The, the answer is, um, thanks to this groundwater pumping this year, it's only going to affect a relatively small amount. The number was $2.2 billion. That's in a $42 billion industry. And, and it's going to be, it's not going to affect the prices of fruit, the prices of vegetables, prices of nuts. It is going to affect some pockets of citrus growing and of tree growing in the south, but the and it is going to cost the farmers this extra half a billion dollars worth of pumping costs, which will have some impact on the rest of the um, energy economy. Richard, if I could add to that, I think the sector that had the harshest hit first was our livestock sector because our beef cattle industry is very dependent on grazing lands that normally are replenished with winter rains and the snowpack that melts and brings that about. So a lot of our longtime ranchers have had to disperse their herds. And for them, that's, that's a decades-long process of building the genetics of those herds. And then when you let them go, it takes multiple years to rebuild them. We've seen that the, the blessing side of that is that because of the Midwest and the Midwest drought two years ago, those ranchers are rebuilding their herds. So our California ranchers had to sell a lot of cattle, but they sold them at higher prices. Sorry about that, Nebraska and other states. Um, but it is very hard. It's a very emotional decision that those ranchers have had to make when they reduce their herd size down or sometimes completely sell off their herds, and then what that rebuilding process means. I also don't want to be an alarmist, but many of our farmers are looking at what is the long-term impact on a permanent crop when you're doing minimal watering, when maybe the salt levels are higher, are we impacting future productivity? And that's something we just won't know until we measure it over time. Can I just ask a follow-up question on that? Um, I don't know if this is true, and tell me if it's not, but I remember some years ago writing about water prices in California for farmers, they seem to be excessively low. And there was always this sort of combat between the, the cities and, and the farming community over water. Um, how has this impacted the price of water for farmers and also this eternal sort of uh, Oh, the question is um, for our web web viewers. Um, you know, are are farmers paying too little for water, and is it exacerbating conflict between um, city and rural water users? One of the interesting comparisons and contrasts to the 2009 drought is in 2014 there is no urban agricultural conflict because the urbans took a portfolio approach in the south. And they are, for this year, in good shape. They are not trying to buy agricultural water. The other phenomenon that is really surprising is that the trading of water within farms uh, has reached prices which are quite extraordinary. The maximum prices in 2009 were four to five hundred dollars an acre foot for scarce water. Um, uh, two months ago, a certain amount of water was put up for bid. They had 20 bids over $1,000. Um, so it's gone up by about three times, and some water has even sold for 2000 This is in agricultural growers. Essentially, think of it as the cost of rescuing a permanent investment in, in trees that you've planted. So we're starting to see an active but rather poorly documented uh, within agricultural water market with much higher prices. So I take it there's a lot more drilling going on. Yes. If you want to drill a well, you have to wait uh, 10 months to get a drilling rig on your property, e e even with financial incentives. Um, okay. I have a question uh, from uh, John Hurdle 
of Market News International in Philadelphia. Um, how much, if any, has the drought pushed up produce prices so far? And how much more are they expected to rise later this growing season? Please provide specific examples. And how much acreage has been fallowed and how much has this reduced production of specific crops? Ditto for meat, eggs, and dairy. I'll, I'll take a quick one on that. It's, it's in the report uh, in detail, but fundamentally not as much as you would have thought. We're fallowing 430,000, we think. The satellite thinks we've, we've got dry land areas as opposed to fallow because of drought, a bit bigger than that. We've seen significant price rises in hay due to the drought in alfalfa hay and uh, other feedstuffs. But in fact, for the main crops, we've seen thoroughly good prices in terms of the tree crops, nut crops, and vegetable crops, but they're not going up due to shortages from the drought, as far as we can tell, just a few percentage points. In terms of the livestock, hay has gone up by about 40%, but hay is about 20% of the cost of producing milk, and the cost of grain, which is bigger than hay in milk, has gone down, and milk price has gone up. So overall, we think that the milk industry is only going to lose about 200 million, which is relatively small in, in a $6 billion output industry. Yes. The question is, um, are there areas um, where we can improve efficiency for specific crops? Um, yes, there, there is. And um, one of the things I meant to do earlier was acknowledge our great partners at the federal level, um, and especially at USDA, which made a number of programs available immediately after the drought declaration earlier this year. An example of where there's a strong desire to improve on-farm water use efficiency was the oversubscription to the $25 million that Secretary Vilsack made available through the EQUIP program. They had $25 million available, received about 2,000 applications for over $50 million worth of projects. Um, the legislature earlier this year made $10 million available to my department for a similar program that just went out for uh, grant applications last week. It's the State Water and Energy Use Efficiency Program where we will accept grants for improved water use efficiency, decreased energy use, and de decreased greenhouse gas emissions. So we anticipate with, with the acreage that still is not under precision irrigation methods of some kind, that there's still room for us to improve both on the farms as well as in urban landscapes. Let me just add a little bit to that. We, we have to be, I think, careful with uh, irrigation efficiency. There's a lot of good reasons to, to have higher efficiency uh, in agricultural irrigation. Uh, it reduces salt loads to systems and nitrate loads to groundwater. But we also have to realize that the so-called inefficiency of irrigated agriculture is often the biggest source of aquifer recharge in wet years. So we, can't, we can undermine the storage of water in groundwater in the long term for droughts if we have too tight an irrigation efficiency on the surface without compensating recharge basins and things like that. So we have to be very careful with that. Uh, there's often, an, an, uh, people often overstate or overthink that, over overestimate the uh, impact of agricultural conservation. The other part of your question was about technology, and I think that we're ready for a new era of the marriage of technology with agriculture when we think about sensor technology and, and remote sensing, um, improving weather forecasting and weather stations, and all the things that farmers do nowadays with their handheld devices, that with additional investments in broadband, thank you USDA again for that, to really marry uh, advances in technology to more precise use of all of our inputs on the farm. Pro probably the biggest advantage of precision agriculture is it raises crop yields. Yeah. yeah. It makes it and more quality profitable. Too. And quality. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Yield profitability, I should probably <laughs> summarize as. That last question was from Science Magazine, I forgot to mention. Yes, sir. Uh, Alan Newhouser with U.S. News. Alan Newhouser with U.S. News. If this drought continues as predicted, 
what measures might need to be taken in terms of finding water from other sources, such as desalination or <coughs> water from elsewhere? Um, the question is, there's a great deal of emphasis on conservation. What other measures should be taken, um, such as desalinization or, or other uh, ways to uh, reuse our water? Well, f for, th for this drought, you have to think of some something you can do in a year or two. And uh, building desalination plants, getting them permitted, res wastewater reuse, uh, you know, building pipelines to the Pacific Northwest, those things are not going to happen for this drought. So for this drought, we're really limited to what we do in terms of, of direct water conservation, um, following land, uh, groundwater management, uh, and water markets. I mean, this, this is what we've got. This is what we have to manage with for this drought. And earlier this year, the State Water Resources Control Board did um, release emergency regulations that will help accelerate the use of recycled water, in addition to $800 million that they made available uh, as loans with 1% interest, as a way to try to accelerate shovel-ready projects that are there and encourage more use of recycled water. And the marriage of ag and urban partners uh, with the ability to safely use um, treated wastewater um, as many of our wastewater systems are having to meet new water quality standards could be a way of just supplementing the overall water picture. An mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, interesting factoid on desalinization is a lesson to be learned from Australia, which had the big dry for six years. During this, there were six desal plants built for urban sources. Currently, four of those six plants uh, are not operating. They're shut down because they cost too much even to run. And you can certainly buy a plant very cheaply from the Queensland government if you wish. Um, I, I think there's, uh, there's some significant lessons to be learned with our cousins in Australia. Another arid climate is be careful throwing billions of dollars at a technology which is fundamentally expensive to run because you've got disposal costs of the brine and you've got energy costs, which are inevitably currently under technology, linked one-to-one -one with the ability to get water. So if you, want to, if you want a desal plant, talk to the Aussies. They've got several for you. Yes. Kathy Taylor, Orange County and Los Angeles Register. Uh, so you're in Washington, and you're meeting with us. Uh, are you also here on public policy business? Are you meeting with members of Congress or department agencies? And with what message and what for? Uh, the question is, um, um, in addition to being here to brief the press um, at a newsmaker, um, are you also meeting with uh, policymakers? And what will your message be? Um, yes, we, we are. It's primarily to keep them updated because of the interest in the first, the preliminary report that was released in April. So we've had a lot of requests to be updated as we have additional information of what those impacts are. Um, and, and to encourage our delegation to work together um, for our long-term water solutions. So it's not a specific ask, but certainly want to be an information source to our lawmakers here in town. And what's the status of the drought relief bill that passed in May? And what's the status of the drought relief bill that passed in May? Again, a question from the Orange County Register. Um, I, I think it's like a lot of things in Congress that's kind of on pause right now. <laughs> and are you encouraging them to pass that or take them? Well, certainly um, there are members of the California delegation that have been doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings and, and shuttle diplomacy, and we certainly encourage them to find the compromise that will get the votes to, to move that legislation. It does provide some additional flexibility. Um, I'm a very optimistic person, but um, I'm a 50-50. How's that for catching my bets? Additional questions. Yes, ma'am. Mm. Uh, what happens if we don't? What do these projections look like? And for the longer term, if we do have climate change, if the Sierra snowpack is, uh, starts melting sooner and there's less of it, how sustainable is California's economy with a population of, of 50 million in 2050? That's a great question. Uh, the um, question. Let me just repeat the question, Jay, for all the people who are watching it's a great question. in the other <laughs> parts of the country. <laughs> um, you know, um, if El Nino does not materialize, um, what are you projecting? And uh, 
Um, if the Sierra snowpack um, starts melting sooner, what will the likely impacts be? Well, I mean, first of all, as, the, as the, the slides I think I showed about the plot between runoff in California and El Nino, don't count on El, El Nino for anything. Uh, whether you, if you have high El Ninos, you can still have low, low flows. And in Northern California, El Nino is not very well correlated with, with stream flow. So don't count on an El, El Nino. Don't even look at the forecast if you're interested in drought. Um, can California sustain itself as a, as a huge economy with a, a, a highly valued ecosystem and, and, and highly valued agriculture um, in its climate? I, I think we're always going to struggle. To me, it's remarkable how well California does. If you look at any other Mediterranean climate in the world, we have an, an amazingly large economy, an amazingly successful um, environmental uh, environment, uh, native species, although we, we have a lot of problems with them, we have a lot less problems than every other um, Mediterranean climate, and we have a, a, a still a growing population. So I think we're going to see some compromises that we have to make, and we're going to have to get smarter about how we make water serve multiple purposes. Um, some people are going to suffer. Water's, water is a scarce commodity in California, and we have to act that way all the time. Yes, ma'am. should be growing given the smaller amount of water in the future and how you might other than just the market forces encourage people to grow such things? Uh, the question is, um, could you address winners and losers in a deepening California drought? Uh, you mentioned cotton going away. Um, you mentioned permanent crops. Um, what will a continued drought force us to plant? Um, winners and losers. Uh, well it, well, well drillers are winners. Um, people with strong groundwater uh, sources are winners. People without groundwater and with tenuous or canceled surface water contracts are losers. And so we see the losers are concentrated on the west side of the central San Joaquin Valley and on the east side. This is the new part, the east side of the front area, small citrus growers and small vegetable growers and fruit growers are also losers this year. So uh, this is this is the the impact. And, and there was, sorry, that was the second part of your question. Well, I mean, how do you, as you look ahead, how do you encourage farmers, other than having the market-driven price of water, encourage farmers to perhaps look at crops that might be better for California's continued drought? Um, I, I, I'm an economist, and the, so therefore I believe that the crops which are best for California's economy are the ones that make the most money for the economy as a whole. And that includes, of course, the multipliers of processing of food and labor. Fortunately, these crops are in a growing market. We are the one agricultural area in this country, with the possible exception of Florida, that grows crops that people buy more of as they get wealthier. It's what, what economists would call an income elasticity of demand. And as the Pacific Rim does well, so do we. And so I am confident that California is in good shape to expand its value, employment, profitability of both the agricultural sector and the urban sector where conservation is working well, even if we have to downsize what I call the water footprint. So if we have to make le le less water, and it's possible under climate change that our net water use will have to drop by about 15 or 20 percent. I think we can still do just fine, both in terms of the urban economy, the high-tech economy, the environmental amenities, and the agricultural economy, because we are extremely lucky in having this market growth worldwide. Karen, did you want to add? Uh, to I, just, I just wanted to add that that's part of effective groundwater basin management is that we determine what a safe yield is and people know what their water availability is and they make the choice, which is very important to farmers and ranchers that they get to make that choice based on their land, based on their infrastructure for being able to service that particular commodity and what they know their, their water availability is to be able to determine that 
and it tends to sort itself out based on market conditions as well as their infrastructure and what their expertise is in. So I think getting to those safe yield determinations within those groundwater basins, what we can do to safely and sustainably manage that basin will be a part of helping all of this to shake itself out. California has, a, as you saw from the maps, a tremendously variable system. It, it's, it's highly varied agriculture, 400 different crops, yep. lots of different microclimates, lots of different local watersheds, and, and tremendous varieties of ecosystems and water uses. It, it's very hard to manage that system well if you manage it in, with, with very heavy-handed regulations. So much variability. Mike Doyle, McClatchy. Since the groundwater reserves for this year have softened the flow, Um, is, sorry. Um, say that again, Mike. Since the groundwater reserves have been depleted, since they're not being replenished, does that set the stage for a more severe impact next year? And can you elaborate on that? Um, since the groundwater reserves have been depleted, does that set the stage for more severe conditions next year? And what will we do about it? The answer is, is yes. We ran, we linked this engineering model hydrologic model to the economic model and said if we pump this very large amount this year, what's going to happen to water levels? Two impacts. One is everybody pays more to pump their water because they're pumping it from 20 to 40 foot higher lifts. So it's an energy cost. The most severe impact though, which we made some estimates of, was the proportion of relatively shallow groundwater wells that would dr go dry. And this ranged from uh, one or two percent to as high as 15 percent in, in certain areas, depending on their pattern of, of shallow wells and their engineering drop in water. So we've got, again, going back to what Karen says, we've got to seriously, very seriously look at this, because these people cannot get anybody to drill a well for them for love nor money. And some of them are going to be halfway through their growing season and their wells will, will go dry. And, and of course, if you drill a deeper well, you're just risking your other na your neighbor's wells in the future if you're pumping more. We saw uh, about a 5% increase in the cost of pumping the same amount of water each year as the drought goes on. This, this is, this is a, a parallel um, to 1977. When I, I bought my property, I was told, the house well went dry in 77. So I've, I've got a personal interest in this, and I'm sitting there waiting for it to happen. Um, I have a question from Elizabeth Grossman, who's a freelance reporter in Oregon. Um, could any of the speakers explain if the impacts of this drought are being or expected to be exacerbated by climate change-related effects, and if these effects and if there are effects that are being exacerbated by climate change, can they explain what these effects are, how they're related to climate change? Um, California, like I, like I said before, ha has always had droughts and probably always will have droughts. A and so I think the climate change question is, does climate change change the frequency of our droughts and the character of them, uh, the lengths and depths of the droughts? Um, I don't really know the answer to that. Uh, the climate is becoming warmer. We are seeing a shift in every season from having less snow melt, snow melt so less runoff in the, in the uh, spring to, and more in the winter. Now that does uh, reduce, it makes it harder to manage water because the water is, is running off at a time that's further from when we want it. But um, it's not catastrophic if we manage it well. From all the climate change studies that we've done, we don't see catastrophe if you manage it well, but we do see inconvenience and we do see costs. Yeah, I was just going to say, and that's why planning is so critically important, and we're undertaking a lot of that at the local level. Most of our communities now have climate adaptation plans and thinking ahead about some of those catastrophic impacts as well as what we're doing at the state level for climate change. So it really requires that we're very thoughtful and deliberate about planning. Great, and uh, the USDA staff has asked me to announce that um, Secretary Vilsack plans to visit Fresno uh, this May the 18th, this, this Friday. Friday the 18th, excuse me, um, to announce additional funding to help rural communities there um, adapt to drought conditions. Any other questions before we finish? 
Yes, Mike. Uh, for, for Karen, you said that you anticipate a vigorous discussion on groundwater. Yep. That sounds like a euphemism. Could you describe <laughs> the, the political climate among your farm constituents with regard to groundwater management? And for, and for Richard, uh, would, do you agree with the Secretary that local rather than statewide management of groundwater is, <laughs> is best suited to the problem? Um, the question is, um, you know, is the vigorous discussion of groundwater management is a euphemism? Could you explain further? And what was the second part? The second question is, does the UC Davis people agree that local rather than state management of groundwater is most appropriate? Uh, do the UC Davis scientists agree that uh, local management rather than um, central, more centralized statewide management is most appropriate? So, Mike, my translation is, uh, of a vigorous discussion is just that. It's obviously been a discussion that's had pieces of legislation enacted over the last 30 years, but it's been a 30-year discussion. So I would say the, the anxiety level of the farm constituency is very, very high. And it's partly because they feel that this is being only about the drought, and they're already feeling so desperate with the re severe reductions in surface water allocations. Groundwater is doing exactly what it was designed to do, and that is to help us get through a drought. And so helping, helping everyone to remember this is part of a water action plan and resiliency moving forward. It's not a punitive action for this year. It's about securing the future of agriculture through effective groundwater management so that we have that in the bank when we need it for future droughts. So working with the farm community, they understand that there is going to be change, that they need to be at the table. That does not mean that they're anxious, anxiously happy about doing that, but they are very anxious about what the repercussions could be. It has huge repercussions, and you can appreciate that. But I think at the end of the day, with the kind of framework that the administration has outlined and the good working relationship we have with the authors and the sponsors of the two bills that have been introduced, I think that we can get to a very reasonable and acceptable approach that will bring some additional certainty to the agricultural community and it very much is about securing their future by having this reliability in our groundwater management system. To answer your question, Mike, the answer is yes. I think groundwater is best managed by local areas, particularly if they're contiguous with the sensible hydrologic areas. However, the state has an important role, twofold. One is the state needs to define what sustainability of groundwater really means, uh, i.e. how many years can it be drawn down before it's put back and how should it be put back. Secondly, the state needs to be quite clear that any of these basins and all of them, groundwater use needs to be measured. And, and so they have to set the criteria by which it's measured, the frequency and the spatial scale on which it's measured. So if we measure stuff and we set the criteria, we will leave it to the locals to work out how to meet those criteria. I think another important role of the state is to, through its enabling legislation, allow locals to organize themselves and finance themselves to undertake these tasks. That this is something which is also uh, a little difficult right now. So the state really needs to establish the framework for local management that will be workable and, and effective. Okay, um, that concludes today's Newsmaker. Thank you so much for coming. Um, if you'd like a copy of the full report, which is, again has been released at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m., uh, Pacific time, um, please email Kat Curlin, who's the UC Davis um, Communications Director at K.E. Curlin, that's K-E-K-E-R-L-I-N, at ucdavis.edu. And it's also on um, the Center for Watershed Sciences website. Um, that concludes our briefing. Thanks for coming.